Hello, my friends. I hope you had a fantastic week. This week, I wanted to share an interview I did a couple of weeks ago with Emma. Now, Emma helps people transition their wealth journey from, I would imagine, not much, pretty average, to actually being able to be in abundance through some strategies that she's going to talk about in this episode. And we're also going to talk about the concept of living below your means, but also the concept of success porn and some of my findings in the second business uh, that I've kind of alluded to already in some other content. Thank you so much for coming back. Hope you enjoyed this interview. I'm now going to hand over to past me and Emma to explain a little bit more about wealth, success porn and etc. like that. So I'll see you in just a moment's time. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm Emma Wright, um, and I am a chartered financial planner and a certified financial coach. Um, and I'm also an ex-investment banking trader. I was a trader for 10 years in London in my 20s uh, before I relocated to very sunny North Devon, where I um, founded my own financial planning business. So for the last two years, I founded Independent Wealth. So I'm also a fellow entrepreneur. So I understand the pitfalls of running your own business. I understand the ups and downs of having financial kind of stability with consistent cash flow, ups and downs, the roller coaster of not only um, running a business, but also life. I'm a mummy of Harry and Rose, um, a two and a five year old, and I'm juggling that around trying to also change the planet and save the planet from what I feel is the biggest challenge at the moment, which is the climate crisis. One little ripple, one little pound at a time <laughs> so that's me in a nutshell <laughs> thank you so much for coming on emma i uh, you know the reason why i wanted to get you on and, and you know have a conversation with you is because i think which is something we actually touched on on the pre-conversation before the show which is this concept around i'm not a millionaire so i'm not successful right and i think or even billionaire or, or etc 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 right i don't have lots and lots and lots and lots of money but I think that kind of comes down to vision, that comes down to firstly where you are in your life, what your priorities are, but also secondly, I think it's kind of what I would only describe as like success porn that we're kind of described and we're taught and we're showcased. I mean, you may know, uh, the audience may know as well that, you know, we're noticing this in the second business a lot at the moment where it's the things that are getting viewership is the quote unquote anything we would class under success porn so the house the car the success the money the girl etc but i think there's a level of you need to give the context around that and you need to understand the context around that especially as an entrepreneur because perceivably i think entrepreneurs can be perceived as this powerful you know especially if things are going well and you're successful and it reminds me of a conversation, and I'll, uh, and I'll ask you a relevant question in a second about it, but it reminds me of a question of like, don't meet your idols that I was talking to a friend of mine about this morning. And it's one of those things where I think you realize everyone who is successful or wealthy or powerful is as fallible and is going to make as many mistakes as you have, if not more. And I think the, the crux there, I guess, is where, how does someone break away from I'm not a millionaire. I'm not making lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of money, but I can still be happy and fulfilled in my life. Because I think that's quite a dangerous rat race to get into, which is the reason why I ask you, because I think especially as a younger person, if the meaningful change I can make into the world with the show is going to be to, I guess, change the perception of what success is, right? I think is the better framing of it or the better articulation of it. How have you, how do you help your clients? How would you suggest someone changes their mindset around i'm not a billionaire i don't have a massive house i don't have the million pound hat etc etc et that comes with the classic success element oh, i love that <laughs> success porn uh, i think i'm gonna pinch that no it's great um there's two things here that i think really really important and i'll touch on both of them the first thing is defining what success is I like to think of like when we think about um, kind of how we can grow our success, I like to redefine what wealth means. So we'll talk about that firstly, what is the meaning of wealth, the true meaning of wealth? And secondly, I think it comes down to your beliefs, systems about what you are worthy of. And when we see, you know, ultra rich, ultra successful people, um, you know, the whole definition of that rich being rich is successful being rich doesn't mean you're wealthy and when you redefine what wealth is I think that becomes really apparent but 
when we don't believe that we are necessarily deserving of wealth, we then hold ourselves back in business and we don't go after the success that we deserve or that we desire. And sometimes because we believe that rich people are evil, because we have seen that people with a lot of money don't always do good in the world. You know, people with a lot of money don't do the things that we're sat here thinking, why can't they just create electric cars? Why they've got all this money? Why aren't they doing those things? We therefore believe that rich people are greedy. Fundamentally isn't true. It's just that the riches or the money that can maybe help us to create some of those positive changes isn't in the right hands. And we can make that money and it is okay for us to make more money than we need because when we make more money than we need, we can have that positive impact. So I guess the first, the, the going back to that first part of what's really important is um, the meaning of wealth. The meaning of wealth, the old English word wealth came from the old English word weller, meaning well-being. So wealth is defined not by money. Money is just a tool. Money is like energy that you can use to do things with. Your meaning of wealth is your well-being, your energy, your abundance. Like How abundant do you feel? Like looking around you and really appreciating what is right in front of you in this present moment. Tomorrow never comes. How you spend, um, what sort of lifestyle you lead how you spend your time and your health. That is really what wealth is because I've seen it as a chartered financial planner when I was looking after um, lottery win winners, that people that won lottery winnings, um, you know, they went from having very little money to having a lot of money overnight. Money doesn't bring you happiness. Actually, it can just amplify the way you feel about yourself. And we see that often with celebrities when they become successful overnight by, you know, suddenly becoming into this lifestyle and this money and then they end up being in and out of rehab or something so it really is true that if you want to be wealthy let's not put our kind of focus on money let's think about how we can build wealth and what does that wealth mean to you because if you can really start to change the narrative and believe that your that your life is wealthy right now your brain doesn't know what's true or false only what you tell it and you can really kind of manifest the life you want to lead and then take little steps to get you there. And you're more likely then to grow a business that's meaningful to you, that makes the money that you really do deserve to make. And then you will carry on building upon that wealth throughout your life and live, lead what I believe is like a really purpose led driven life. It's yeah. I think it's important to mention, right, like we're not saying that making money needs to be this evil thing, right? Like everyone needs to make a living to keep the lights on shore, fine. I think the question is, what lifestyle do you want to have? And then at that point, you know, do you, I value control? I value freedom. I value family, right? These are high values to me personally. Okay, so technically following that logic, me being successful is achieved already, right? Right now. Because I have control over my freedom, of my time, of my control, etc. Family, so on, so on. That still doesn't necessarily become the driving factor for me, though, because money, as you alluded to, is a tool to gain a more meaningful change in the world. The issue where meaningful change gets complicated is because everyone's meaningful change is different, right? Now, for me personally, one of the things and one of the cornerstones of Brunner Media has been let's make meaningful change for my local community here in Salisbury because I don't, I didn't feel, and I still don't to an extent, that it was being promoted and showcased enough, right, as a city, as a community, etc. So something which I've tried to do as the company has become more successful is leverage the fact that I have more disposable income because of that fact to then be able to push the needle further, right? But I think. Let's go right back to basics then, right? So if we're saying that you being super wealthy isn't actually the quote-unquote definition of success, how does someone come to connection or come to terms with their definition then? Because it's very easy for us to say, because arguably we're both in the position where we are successful within our own definitions of the term. But we have done the work to firstly understand what it is that we would describe it as and then be able to obtain it because if you don't know where you're going it's impossible to know how to get there right so how would you tackle either with a client or with you know a, f a friend etc to actually help them understand and i guess in some ways remove that kind of misconception around like 
either the money aspect of like, I need to make a hundred grand a year. I need to make a million pounds, etc., which we discussed. But how can someone really get reconnected with what is success for them? Because it's so personal. It's so different to everyone, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the biggest one of the biggest things that I do when I first get to know a client is I do um, financial value solicitation. A lot of people don't actually think about what they care about. We're on autopilot, and often we're living our lives in alignment, or actually not in alignment, but kind of living our lives on like um, a treadmill. And our autopilot, our kind of automatic habits that are impacted by our beliefs and our feelings kind of the scent the, the, the thing that's inside our subconscious um brain is put on us by um our family our parents our grandparents all of those things um impact how we um act today and we just we don't take time to like, kind of take a step back and check in and say is this really what I care about? Is this really what I feel and love and value? And the, one of the biggest things when people come to me is they're saying, well, I have no money. I have no surplus money. I can't invest. I can't, um, you know, I can't do the things that I want to do. Um, you know, there's a cost of living crisis and it can feel really challenging. The biggest thing I do before I do anything is I get really clear on what people care about, you know, and I say, what do you seek from money? It's a really great coaching question to ask. What do you seek from money? What do you seek from your life? What do you seek from wealth? Um, and when you get really clear on what it is that you're seeking and those words that can come up, often we do come up with freedom. You know, freedom is something that comes up a lot. Um, time, you know, holidays, experiences, those kind of aspirational values come up a lot. Sitting behind that, when you ask yourself again, like what, what else is there? What else do you seek? That's when you can get to some really core values that can sometimes not just protect you, but keep you stuck in where you are now. And those kind of core values can be safety, security, control. And you you mentioned the word control. And those kind of core values um, are really, really important to you. And it's really important that you respect those core values. But often that stops you from living a life of freedom because it can sometimes keep you stuck maybe in employment. If you're thinking of going into an entrepreneurial space, it can also keep you stuck um, working really, really long hours in your self-employed job, even though you got in it for freedom, you end up back in that control and, and being really busy because that's the only way to make money um, is be, by being really, really busy and filling all the hours because that's what we've always been conditioned to do. So taking stock of what your core beliefs are, making sure that you are really aware of what matters to you. And then what's around that, those aspirational values, it's bringing in those habits one step at a time, you know, it might feel really hard to do something that's a little bit more freeing or out of your comfort zone. So bringing that new habit in and kind of doing those things are really is really, really empowering. That's kind of one of the ways that you can start to create a change in you. Um, you know, it can take 28 days to six months to create a new neurological pathway. And if you really have strong beliefs about money, or about your worthiness, or about how you should live your life. If you're saying you should do something, check in on that. Should you be doing it? Is that something you really value or really care about? Because if it isn't, then you are wasting time, energy, and money. And usually when people do this, one of the things that happens is that they, all of a sudden, they find, they, they look at their spending habits. It's one of the things you can look at. Because when you look at how you spend your money, you can see how you're spending your time and energy as well. And you can kind of rate your spending against your values. And if it isn't aligned with what you want to be doing, you can say, okay, that isn't aligned with what I want to be doing. Like one of the things that I realized that I was doing, um, you know, I'm trying to save the planet. I'm trying to be plastic free. And I was buying takeaway coffees um, on my way. And I was like, right, one simple change is I could get an eco cup and I can start making my own coffee in the morning, saving money, saving the planet, and it makes me feel really good. Every time I have that urge to stop a, stop at the coffee shop, I walk past and then I, that gives me dopamine because the dopamine takes you towards that. And then you have the guilt coming out because you're thinking, I've spent my money. I'm doing something that I don't want to be doing. And then you kind of move forward. So it's it's creating those little lifestyle changes, one little thing at a time that can have a big profound impact on your wealth. 
I think that's a really important point because I think some people will look at maybe how I work or maybe look at what I'm doing and they'll say, Cole, when you talk about freedom, you talk about control, you talk about wealth, you talk about making money, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But you work every hour there is. You work every, you work seven days a week. You work 365 days a year. However, I'll asterisk it by saying, yes, I do, and you're right. However, you need to appreciate and understand that this is a, a, a certain amount of time a significant period of time that I have agreed to myself I'm going to commit to grow the business, right? From the age of 30 onwards is when the second 10-year gap, which I haven't even discussed in content yet because it's not relevant, but the second 10-year gap of my life begins, right? So for me, I think it's about understanding the phase you are in your life, what you're willing to sacrifice during that phase, and what that actually means for you right? So for me, it means my personal expenditure basically goes to non-existence. I don't get to spend on f- what we call, what we would call fun money within reason, right? Holidays, new clothes, watch, etc, 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 right? Or if I do, they're limited, right? In exchange for, in comparison to business expenses or growth expenses, etc, etc, etc. And I think it's important for someone when they're trying to build something of meaningful value to them, whether that's a business, a relationship, a job, a career path, etc. Because let's be honest, right? Entrepreneurship isn't for everyone necessarily. For me, it's my best asterisk thing to make money with because I've had traditional jobs. I've never, ever operated well with a boss, so to speak, right? So me being my own boss is a good idea for who I am, right? But that also doesn't mean that everyone should be as, you know, driven and as pushed as I am to create something as large and meaningful and etc. But also it means you shouldn't then in 10 years go, oh, Colton's so lucky because Colton is just magically lucky because he has all these things and he is the perceived he is and the brand is etc. Because I worked 10 years to build the brand to the point where it was that thing. Right. So you can't have it both ways. Either you're willing to sacrifice the 10 years, five years, eight years, whatever of your life to build something, quote unquote, meaningful. So the meaningful change is more important to you than just I'm going to be okay or content with my life for the foreseeable. This is not a critique. This is an observation. And I think it's very important for people who are maybe listening, especially the younger demographic, to really consider what do you want your life to be and are you willing to sacrifice a percentage of your life now so that you can live a life that many can't in 5 10 15 years right i mean is there a correlation to with what with i i imagine there is with what you do in the respect to that mindset shift around short term because the the age old saying is like we don't want to sacrifice the now for later on in our life, right? That's the, the crux of many quotes that I could use here. But the, I think that comes from a lack of uh, level of scarcity in respect to money isn't going to be there in 10 years or the girl isn't going to be there in 10 years or the beach isn't going to be there in 10 years, right? Which is ridiculous when I say it like that, sure. But that's how a lot of people's mindsets are, right? Oh, it's so many things here that I think are so important to talk about. Firstly, I do think it's important to talk about different stages of life because um, when we're born, we have to fulfill our ego part of ourselves and the ego being we need to get our basic needs met. So it's really normal to work for somebody or to be building and to be in that building stage. And, you know, when I was in my 20s, I was in London, I was away from my family, I was sacrificing, I was on the trading floor, you know, I was seven till seven on the dealing floor, I was out networking at night, you know, and and, but the thing is, and this is really important, is when you're doing something that makes you jump out of bed, and you are building something, you're living in alignment of purpose and intention, and you are really choosing that that is what you want to be doing, because not everybody wants to be laying on a beach, right? That's, it's, it's about what do you want to be doing? When I think of spending my time now um, living for today, tomorrow never comes. I think you're absolutely right in the sense of for you right now, you want to build your business and that's where you want to be. And one of the things is once they, they say around age 40, it's not exact science, around age 40, you start to kind of move into your spirit self. And I'm, I'm 40 and about three Four years ago, I started to have an itch to scratch. I was like, I was working all the hours. 
I had a very young family um, and I just realized, blimey, I'm living in North Devon and why do I not, why, don't, why am I still not surfing? Why do I not find the time? And it's a beautiful part of the world. And it's almost like I realized that something else mattered to me. Um, and I was so busy um, working really, really hard that actually I wasn't doing a job that was meaningful to me, I kind of got caught up in that rat race. And that can ha happen for a lot of people where they're building that, that kind of intention up and they don't actually, they're not building it up for themselves. They're not necessarily creating that wealth and abundance for themselves. They're trading their time and energy for money for somebody else to build up that entrepreneurship. So I believe there are many entrepreneurs out there, but they just don't know how to turn their skills into their venture. They don't know how to do it. And that's one of the things that I love to do is to help people and guide people in order to leverage all of their assets and build wealth. So where you are in your stage of life is really important because if you're kind of in that early stage of life, actually learning your craft building your money, building that financial stability and security is really important. And actually, you might not be ready to move into the spirit self where now I'm thinking the purpose of my business is about reversing the climate crisis. I realize that's something that I've always been drawn back to. Um, and, you know, that's because I've got my basic needs met. I've got my knowledge. I've got, you know, over 20 years in financial services, I have all of the exams. I, I've charted beyond like ridiculous and I've never taken an exam again. I've, I've kind of got to the point where I, I, you know, I feel secure to kind of start giving some of that abundance away as well, you know, so that I can start de delivering on what my, my higher purpose is. I also believe, and I think this is really important, one of the things that you said about um, not everybody wants to be an entrepreneur, I fundamentally agree with that. Not everybody wants to run a business because it is difficult running your business. It does take, you know, grit, grit and determination. And some days you wake up and it's lonely and you think, I mean, why, does, why am I doing this? And it does take a different kind of personality and we're all made completely different. I've always had a C eo energy or a leader's energy i like you have really struggled to be an employee and that's why i'm now running my business i could never go back i believe if more people like you and i brought these opportunities forwards we can hire people into our purpose-led businesses for the people that don't want to run their own business we can give opportunities to those people so that the kind of the, the, the where people are working where they're where they want to be they can be in those purpose-led businesses and those heartfelt businesses, and it will create more opportunity um, and just, you know, uh, uh, so much better kind of community um, and planet-led opportunities. So, I, and I believe you can have it both ways, you know, fundamentally. You can, can you have it all? Do you have to give something up to have what you want? I don't think you have to give something up because like you say, you are being very intentional with the fact that you want to focus on your business um, for me at the minute. And I, I did not think that I could be a mummy and be a business owner and I'm managing it. And I'm slowly, slowly, it's probably taken me longer than someone that doesn't have a family to build independent wealth up. However, I'm doing it really step by step and I'm being really intentional with who I work with and, I, and I'm hitting my financial goals and I'm still about to head off for a run at three o'clock today. I'm heading off for a run. My husband's picking up my little boy, but normally I do pick up and drop off every day. I was at sports day yesterday and I still have a growing client base. And so I, you know, I'm really, really careful about what I say yes to. I'm really, really careful about who I work with um, and fundamentally when I spend my downtime I, I, I'm doing things that really matter to me I, I you know I'm taking my scuba paddy at the minute because I realized that I really wanted to start doing more conservation and being in the ocean and so on Saturday I'm I'm doing my first part of my scuba paddy and, you know, that means that all week, normally I work in the weeks, like weeks after the kids are in bed, I do an hour for, in my business. This week I've been learning scuba and it's felt really hard actually not being on my business. I'm like, oh, I'm feeling really guilty because I'm doing something that's just completely for me. But that was the decision that I made. And sometimes setting little life goals to make sure that you do live 
for today helps you so much to kind of commit to yourself whilst you're building your business up and um, do fun things, not just the things that you, oh, well, I've got to spend a week and I've got five holidays a year, so I could, should go and sit on a beach and um, crisp my body or whatever that is. You know, if we, if we, if we do things that we think we should do, it's, it's not going to give our a kind of our deeper meaning and we're not going to feel that fulfillment um, of, of what it's all about. I think there's a really important point there, which is, you know, something which I talk to my clients about, but I'm sure you talk to your clients about as well, is being ridiculously patient with the results. Because I think there's, especially in the success porn world, it's very get rich quick. It's very, you do this, you do this, you make a million pounds, you do this, you do this, you make 100K, whatever. The reality of business in my experience is you do a lot of shit for a very long time, you get no results, and then suddenly there's a 2% improvement, 4% improvement, 10% improvement that then compounds upon that across two years. Fantastic, well done. The crux there, though, is to trust in what you're doing and trust in the process that it takes for you to grow as an individual as well. And one of the most valuable, I guess, pieces of advice, I forget exactly where I got it from, but the crux of it is... Try to visualize who you are in a world where you're trying to build a company like I am and visualize the person that runs that company. So what are their daily habits? What are their daily routines? What do they spend their life doing? What do they prioritize, etc. And for me, when I say I do, I, I'm driven by meaningful change, who I employ, the culture I have and, and the kind of money I reinvest back into my community is the meaningful change I mean. Because if you look at what Colton has earned from Brunter Media, it's actually less than Colton earned at the start of Brunter Media, which sounds counterintuitive when you appreciate Brunter Media has done nothing but increase in revenue, right? Which is like, unless you don't, if you don't understand business, then you're like, how does that work? The thing is with most growing businesses is their profit margin as an owner is non-existent or tiny, which means because they're not taking the money themselves, the analogy I always use is, I make a £1,000, I'll reinvest 800 or 900 and take the 200 so I can survive. That's it. I'm looking for, for my survival financial health. That's it. That's, and I'm trying to keep that as low as possible so that I can invest more, which in turn means increases the speed of the machine, which in turn means in speeds the growth. But I think sometimes people also don't do that same logic with their time, their energy, their money, their resources and all these other aspects because to truly expand and truly grow personally as a human being but also as a business you have to know how to leverage your time energy and resources all at the same time so that stuff can happen simultaneously and this is one of the reasons why we bang on so much about content is because it's the best way to scale because you can do it once and then it will print you print you money print brand awareness etc etc for the foreseeable future but again is that a mindset shift because i've kind of been in that for a very long time but i guess I don't want to take it as like, I'm entitled because I've got this mindset because that, that's where I think it can go. If someone doesn't have that mindset that's listening to this, how would you suggest they start actually, I guess in some ways, analyzing their time and their energy? Because the money thing's quite easy, right? I'm spending on this, it has this result. But the energy and the time and the commitments and the, I guess in some ways, like saying yes to social occasions, who do you have in your life? Who is your inner circle? Who do you trust with information? All of these things are actually... I was going to say they're the same importance, but actually I'd argue that they're more important than actually the financial end, right? Yeah, so I think that, oh, where do I start kind of unpicking what you've just said? Um, building a business, I think, isn't a race, but we feel like, especially when we leave an employed role or we've been kind of used to being paid or if we're in a corporate role, um we feel and when we're kind of shown what success is by online the online world is can be really kind of unhelpful because we see oh I turned my 40,000 pound debt into a multi-million pound business and it was really really easy and it, you know all you need to do is step a click thing once and then that's it you know it, you missed out <laughs> you missed out the bat flip but yeah. <laughs> you know it Rome wasn't built in a day. And I really believe that to build a business, it's really important that you build it sustainably, consistently, and you give yourself time to build 
to build the business that you want. So that one of the first things that I talk about with my clients when I'm talking to them and helping them to um, build a sustainable business, um, sustainable for the planet, but really importantly as well, sustainable for their time and energy and their money is to get their offering priced correctly, not based on an hourly rate because our, our time is not what we're selling. We're not selling an hourly rate. And that's one of the things that trips a lot of people up when they're selling their, a service-based business, for example, we're talking about here, you know, is that we we think that we have to charge for our time. And then we think, well, my time, especially if you don't think you're worthy, is not worth very much. And then we start to think, well, what if I deliver a one-to-many offering and then I could charge a really small amount because I'm selling it to thousands of people and that can make me rich you're really undervaluing your time and you're also not only are you undervaluing your time you're undervaluing the impact and the transformation that you are creating because it's not about your time spent it's about what is it that you have that can change someone's life because people don't care about okay, it's going to be six sessions or it's going to be a package or I'm buying this thing. They don't care about the process. What they care about is the transformation that they're going to get from buying what it is that you you have. So people don't come to me for a financial plan. That's really boring. They come for the lifestyle that their change is going to give them. They come for that transformation and they come as well for all of the expertise, for the credentials, for what it is that makes me unique. Uh, and, and, you know, kind of the come for me for the trust aspect and to know that I am a vouched for financial coach, for example, and they can check that. So all of those things that makes you really unique is really, really important. I and mean, if you can get your offering, your one-to-one offering, or what you what, what, what it is that you want to kind of sell at, so at the right price, from the outset, without discounting, you're going to be able to leverage then your time and energy because you're, you you might then not need a thousand clients because when you start out in business, you don't have an audience. You don't have a thousand people following you necessarily. You might do. You might be an influencer. But usually for most of us, we come out and we're having to build that audience and we're having to build that brand, build that trust that know, like, and trust. And that can take time. You know, it can take anything from six months to 12 months to get your first single clients coming in. And like you said, it can take then three years until a business becomes profitable if you're investing in the growth and leveraging that business. So giving yourself time is really, really important. And I think the first thing that you need to think about is when you are running, a, launching a business, you need to make sure your basic needs are met. Because you can't just reinvest everything without paying your bills. So I talk about financial your financial freedom number. Get really clear on what you need to send, spend on your life in this present moment. Your essential spending and your non-essential spending as well. What do you want to live in your life right now? Because that's your profit goal at the outset. That's your initial profit goal to give you what you need. And then you start to build on that. And that might be, Okay, you build on that through taking on enough clients to give you more money than you need. When you make more money than you need, then you can comfortably on a consistent or a recurring revenue basis, hire someone. And that hire might be a freelance, but it also might be hiring somebody into your business because that's how then you start to leverage other people are delivering into your business so you don't have to be delivering it. And you're leveraging that. And that's sustainable because you've got your basic needs met you're not necessarily going on luxury holidays whilst you're doing this. You get to choose, but you've got your basic needs met and the basic needs of whoever you're hiring. Because if all of a sudden you have to fire someone, that's really hard and that can cost you money. So don't rush these decisions. You can then decide, OK, well, if I've got a one to one offering that costs five thousand pounds or two and a half thousand pounds or whatever that transformation is value is worth to somebody on a return on investment basis then you can create a one-to-many offering as well you could leverage your time by doing that once your audience is growing and don't suddenly cut your prices because they're still getting the transformation even if they're um buying a one-to-many offering even if they're doing it in a 
group environment, if you've got really good at one to one delivery, you could convert your two thousand pounds one to one price into a two thousand pounds group because also the group aspect is community, it's connection. This they're getting even more transformation. And the biggest mistake, and this I made this mistake when I first started out, I tried to do really treat cheap group offerings because I, I didn't see the value in my one-to-one because I'd suddenly left a wealth management firm and thought, well, I'm not in a big wealth management firm. Who am I? But the uniqueness of what I, I deliver is that when my clients work with me, they genuinely get all of my time and energy because I'm not in a big corporate and I get to design something that's really special and unique and bespoke. I get to do the things in my way and they get something that is completely and utterly around them. And that is amazing. And that's and that coaching element that I bring to it as well is different to what they will get from going to a wealth management firm where it's quite often sometimes square peg into a round hole. There's no square pegs into round holes. And that's what you should see for your business as well that can, to give you the real confidence that what you have is super special and worth investing in. So growing that sustainable revenue, growing in that way, can be really, really empowering. And you're not going to then lead to burnout. You're going to kind of grow at a rate that works for you. And then when you make profit, because if you make profit, because you get your pricing right, you can reinvest, you can add the tech, you can create a beautiful brand, you can invest into your business and really grow it and work with partners like, you know, Brunton Media, you know, you can you can work with partners that can really um, add value to your messaging because once you get your messaging right people find you then and it becomes so it becomes self-fulfilling fundamentally and that's what's really important i feel yeah i mean there's loads there that, that, that I, I could go down but i'll start by quoting a, a really good client uh, of ours which is reza and he talks about you know can you charge a thousand pounds for a 30 minute job yes absolutely you can the crux and the reality that people need to understand is you're charging for the years that it took you to be able to do the 30 minute job in 30 minutes, not the 30 minutes, right? What you're talking about here when you talk about the value that someone's adding or attaching is the mindset shift from this is my hourly rate and this is the value in the product I give or serve or the transformation, et cetera, et cetera. Whether that's a coaching offering, whether that's a video production offering, whether that's a repurposing offering, whether that's a training offering, whatever it is that you do, replace the word video with whatever you do. What's the value the client gets? It's got nothing to do with how long. I've never been asked ever. How many hours did you spend editing this video? They don't care. They don't care. They actually would prefer it was out sooner, right? Because if you can provide a product sooner than like, on average, we'll say two weeks, but let's say it's an event video, I will charge more if it's the next day because of the inconvenience of me having to stay up to do it. But that's actually higher value because the results that that video will then get is going to be higher than me waiting two weeks. Because in most cases with event stuff, if you don't if you don't post a video within three days, no one cares. But that's, I've built a skill set to be able to do it quickly without sacrificing quality. So the client would owe me for the time and the skill set, not the actual time it takes me to do the video. And that's what I think that was the biggest game changer for me when I was really starting to really understand pricing and strategic business operation, because that's what mm -hmm. this is, right? It's actually got nothing to do with how good you are as a tactician either. It's everything to do with the meaningful change you create for a client, right? And then I guess I guess the question then comes though, is especially in a service-based business, so let's use videography as an example, one of the struggles I had for a while was I need to remove my control over doing everything. It has to be done by me. I have to film everything. I have to edit everything. I have to... Uh, da, 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 da. How do you... How would you suggest? How would you advise, etc.? someone removes that kind of limiting belief around, I have to do it, me personally. Colton has to be the one who shots it. Colton has to be the one who edits it. It's a great question. Um, I start with looking at your heart's core and looking at all the things that need doing in your business. If, you, if you've got things in your business, and this is a really good check-in as well, because we start running a business and we, we do all the things, write everything that, you, that you're doing in your business then what does actually needs to be done? Because you can get rid of the stuff that don't need to be done that isn't serving you firstly. That's a big thing. And then of that list, what brings you joy? 
Because if it doesn't bring you joy, that is the thing to give to somebody else to do. You know, I, you know, I look at all the things that I don't enjoy doing. I don't actually always enjoy creating the financial plan. I like the connection with the clients. I like to present it. I like to, to extract the wealth information because that's really coaching and extracting. I like presenting and talking, as you can probably tell. Joy, joy, joy. What's going to get, what am I going to get out of bed for and not dread? The things that I then don't want to do, I could get a para planner to do. And they charge a lesser rate than me because fundamentally it's, you know, creating a financial plan. It's, it can be done quite quickly on, uh, at home. And, you know, so it ends up being that my time is better spent doing things that bring value and also joy. So if you're going to get paid for it, if it's going to give you joy, if it's what the world needs and what the planet needs and, and what your clients need, you should be doing it. And that's what maybe you should be doing as well, because that's where your heart core is. So one of the things that I don't like doing in my business is my bookkeeping. I outsourced it. I, funnily enough, you know, I'm a financial coach. Don't want to do my own bookkeeping. I also don't want to do social media. I hate social media because fundamentally I don't think I'm the best at it and it just takes me a lot longer if I was to sit here editing my media I would never finish it because I'd throw the laptop out the window do the things that you that you enjoy doing and a, a good business outsources are, are high as the things that you're not so good at a really good CEO business as well you know when you when you're running a business you'll hire people that are better than you at doing all the things around you, or you'll collaborate. You don't always have to hire. You can collaborate in business with people that are better than you. So for example, when I'm thinking of like running a mastermind or running something that's going to be really added value to clients, I will collaborate with the best accountants. I will collaborate with the best mindset people, you know, because my skill set is the wealth and the financial stuff. But, you know, fundamentally, all of these other areas, the marketing piece, I'd collaborate with exceptional marketeers that can get your brand message out there. Um, because collaborations are really powerful in business. It's you're sharing the wealth of abundance and you're creating that web of um, kind of network. So I, the, I would say if you're telling yourself you can't, outsource or maybe it feels too hard the financial commitment can sometimes feel quite hard you know you can just you know talk to yourself make sure you're having really positive conversations out loud with yourself because then your subconscious can hear that rewrite that narrative and really just take it one little step at a time to do that if you're doing stuff that you enjoy as well because fundamentally to to have a business that eventually will be sellable you want to replace you in your business and you might want to step away. And so having someone in your business that you do start to feel comfortable giving the things that you love to do, I think that is very empowering as well because you're training someone to be like you. Um, and I'm not there yet in my business. I'm not doing that yet. But that is what all great business owners do. You know, all great managing directors do it. You know, Richard Branson does it in his business, you know, he's fundamentally, he's not running Virgin Virgin Media anymore. He's, he's, he's the person behind the brand, but fundamentally, you know, to be, it is safe to get somebody to do what you do and um, train someone up to be the next you as well, or multiple peoples of you. I think it's also important to mention though, that like, never say never right of course but also have a very honest conversation with yourself and say are you ever going to want to sell genuinely yeah. are you ever want to yeah. because i deliberately when i named my company i said no i'm never going to sell right for me this is a legacy build for the foreseeable future for my family and the name brunton that's why it exists not so i can make a quick buck quote unquote on selling it right I, again never say never priorities change etc etc et however the core principle for me was very important to create a legacy for my mother whose name is brunton that's where brunton comes from right that's why it's called brunton media that's why brunton media is a brand and why i make the investment choices i make and etc 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 but also i'm on a very different time scale to most businesses i have a 50-year growth plan not many businesses have a 50-year growth plan right because of that legacy because it's generational because it's meant to be massive I'm really, really chilled on the timescale because 
I don't need it to magically become a hundred million pound company and then I'm going to sell it on in 10 years. I don't need it to do that. What I need it to do is give me the fulfillment, the control and the legacy tick boxes that I need it to. So then I'm creating my own meaningful change with the company. But I'm aware of time, so I think let's wrap up soon. But for those who've really enjoy, enjoyed this conversation and want to connect with you, where's best for them to do that? Yeah, really quickly, I just want to touch on what you just said about, about legacy really quickly. because um, And what you just said, if you want to create a legacy, it's not necessarily that you're going to sell it. It's creating that kind of asset that can transfer. And people, you know, one of the things that I love to do is creating um, employee buyouts so that someone isn't coming in. So the business is far the, the carry on and the, the people within it or transferable within an estate because that's really important so it can be a be a family asset genuinely and again you have to get to that stage where you aren't needed in it still for it to transfer so um, it's not always about making a quick book it's it is about making sure that the business can can carry on without you and it is a true legacy so so yeah but I love that I think that's you know that was really good to clarify because you know, fundamentally for a lot of us, we want to create that legacy and we want to create that impact and that lasting impact because why put in five years of hard graft for something just to end? You want it to sustain. And, and that's what I really believe about independent wealth as well. You know, it's it's about creating that lasting impact and that lasting change. So people can find me um, at my website. It's myindependentwealth.com. Um, they can also find me um on Instagram and what I can do as well as I can give you a little guide to download um which is about my guide to independence you know I'm happy to drop that over to you so you can add the link if anyone wants to get their hands on my my little guide I can yeah I can drop the link in for you um which is yeah my 12 steps to what I call an independent life so fantastic Thank you so much for the time. Thank you so much for coming on. And final piece of advice for those who start out in business, are concerned about the contraction of the economy. They're like, ah, this might be a bit dicey. I'm a little bit worried. I'm a little bit scared. What would you suggest? Well, we need more people like you because we averted going into the red. The economy is doing better than, uh, than we're told in the media. Don't believe what you're listening to in the news. And it was actually entrepreneurship that um, kept us in the green. So we need more of you. And there is so much opportunity. People are buying. The business owners that I am hearing are having huge success. Um, so, yeah, don't, don't hold back. Just get really clear on what your ikigai is. Ikigai is the Japanese word for living in alignment with your inner purpose. So if you want to launch a business, do four things. Check. Is it what the world needs? Is it going to bring you joy? Is it what you're going to get paid for? And um, yeah, what's the fourth one? Yeah. What what you love, what you're good at, what what the world needs and um, what you're going to get paid for. Because if you've got a tick in all of those boxes, then that is a real good viable business that people need. So don't hold back. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming back and joining me, ladies and gents. I hope you took value from this week's episode and this week's conversation all about wealth creation and the meaningful change and the vision that we can have in our wonderful internet-based world. Thank you ever so much for coming back and joining me once again. If you don't want to miss next week's exciting interview with a brand new guest where we could talk about something valuable to you and your life and your business in 2023, then why not be subscribed to the channel? And I'd love to hear what you think in the comment section down below. And I'll be back very, very soon with some brand new content to hopefully add value to you and your life. And I'll see you 